Hello, I'm Hope Dector, the Creative Director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. I'm happy to be welcoming you to Mad Mapping, a guide to creating an emotional safety plan, a workshop facilitated by Fireweed Collective members, Antoinette Chen Si and Lilac Villette Maldonado. Tonight's workshop is part of BCRW's annual Scholar and Feminist Conference. This year's conference, Living in Madness, Decolonization, Creation, Healing, has all been based online and features events exploring experiences of madness, disability, survival, and refusal through the frameworks of MAD studies, disability justice, and artistic practice. You can find links to all of the conference events in the video description. And Sophie, if you could drop a link into the chat now. We hope that you can join us for the final event of the conference, The Art of Madness, Catastrophe, Memory, Desire, a panel discussion with artists Mimi Cook, Jess X. Snow, and Mariam Bazid, moderated by Vami Nadarajan, taking place this Tuesday, April 12th. I also wanted to bring your attention to another upcoming event at BCRW, Organizing Transformative Justice Responses to Gender-Based Violence and Campus Sexual Violence, which features Circe Mendez in conversation with Dean Spade. That event, co-sponsored by Seattle University, will take place online on Tuesday, April 26th, and you can find more information and registration at bcrw.barnard.edu. I'll keep my remarks as brief as possible, but I want to offer some notes of thanks and accessibility information before I turn things over to Antoinette and Lilac. First, a land acknowledgement. Tonight's event is taking place online, but we are all physically located someplace, and we recognize that all land is Indigenous land. Barnard College is located on the traditional ancestral territories of the Lenape people. In terms of accessibility, you can find a link to access live transcription for this event directly under the video in the YouTube description or on the BCOW event page. Thank you to Corvin Dosti from Total Caption for providing the live transcription. Thank you also to ASL interpreters for tonight's event, Crystal Butler and Stephanie Chow from Coco Language Advocacy and Consulting. We're so grateful to you both for providing this essential service. We're planning for tonight's workshop to take place for two hours, ending at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. If you have a question for the speakers, you can type it into the YouTube chat. I think we'll also be using the YouTube chat for some of the participation in the event. So um, if you are watching this on the event page, you might want to switch over to YouTube so you can participate in the chat that way. We're grateful to be partnering with Fireweed Collective for tonight's workshop. Special thanks to Maya Ram and Agustina Vidal from Fireweed Collective for your work in organizing this event. I also want to thank my coworkers at BCRW for all of their work, including Elizabeth Castelli, Pam Phillips, and especially to Avi Cummings and Miriam Neptune, who together did so much of the work to conceptualize and organize the Living in Madness Conference. Thanks also to Sophie Kreitzberg, who is coordinating the work of this event behind the scenes, including managing the social media and communications during the event. And to BCRW, BCRW student research assistant, Eve Glazier, who is working with Sophie behind the scenes tonight. I'm truly excited for the workshop tonight and I don't wanna take up any more time. So I wanna turn now to welcome Antoinette Chen Si and Lilac Villet Maldonado so they can begin the workshop. You can find their bios on the event page or in the video description. Antoinette and Lilac, thank you both for being here. And I'm going to bring you up on the screen now. Lilac, your camera is off. Hello, sorry about that. Hi, everyone. <laughs> no problem. Ready? And we can start with our welcome slide for Mad Maps. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Lilac Violet Maldonado and uh, welcoming you today to uh, our Mad Maps workshop uh, here with Fireweed Collective. I am proud to be uh, beside my uh, my colleague and comrade here, Antoinette Chen C. Um, Fireweed, uh, we are a collective of uh, abolitionists, mad, disabled, chronically ill folks, um, often people of most of us people of color, immigrants from low income backgrounds. And like uh, we actually offer like new and radical mutual aid and mental health, uh, mental health, uh, excuse me, uh, healing paths. And we are excited to bring our work to you because our work uh, disrupts, the, um, disrupts the, the systems of abuse that have been going on in the medical industrial complex for way too long. So thank you so much for, for uh, for um, having us today, and please look to our work um, on our website at fireweedcollective.org. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, that's me, yay. Okay, um, oh, I just want it first, go ahead. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll, I am first, I'm sorry. Thank you, there we go. All right, y'all. Um, I don't know if you can see my slide properly, but I just want to introduce myself. My name is Lilac. I use she and they pronouns interchangeably, and I've been working as a community organizer and culture worker um, for uh, over 10 years now. Um, but uh, I kind of wanted to, you can read my bio, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about what brings me to the work that I do today. Um, and uh, honestly, it's because I fell through the cracks um, in in every way, because uh, the system was never meant to really was never was designed to keep me out and was never designed to serve me. And so um, I often I didn't get my needs met and I didn't uh, have access to the things that I needed to heal. Um, uh, not only with my physical, but mental health. Uh, I and so by being able to uh, connect to, to um, movement work, uh, it gave me access to learn about the context about myself and the world that I lived in and and, and how I can navigate it in, in in better ways. I learned about you know inter uh, interdependence and and mutual aid and those things kind of gave me a pathway to to people with uh, similar experiences who who understood me and gave me a, a, like a mirrored reality of what it was like. Uh, uh, when I saw reflections of myself in them. And therefore, I also want to create places that uh, center those most affected uh, by oppression. And I also want to create uh, mirrors so people can see reflections of, us, of themselves because we cannot see, we cannot be what we cannot see. So thank you so much for, for having me here this, um, this evening and I'll pass it over to my colleague. Thank you. And thank you, Lilac. And my name is Antoinette Chensi. It is so good to be here with you all. Oh. Um, and I have been a multidisciplinary organizer for more than two and a half decades now. Um, I am a second generation Caribbean American immigrant of mixed class backgrounds. Shout out to all the immigrants that came from the global south who understand that particular life of going back and forth and are able to. Um, and I came to this work with Fireweed as someone in a background of community safety, um, specifically my queer black and brown community who and broke black, queer, and brown community who often use and have been using and relying on our lineages from many of our peoples of what community care mutual aid looks like. Um, and I pull from a lot of that with the work that I am able to do with firewood, fireweed rather. Um, and clearly also we pull from that from all the people who have worked on um, Mad Maps over the past decades um, and will continue to um, offer this shift and adapt it for um, all of our communities. So it is an honor to be here um, with my chronically ill self um, who's uh, faring pretty well today. So 
I will get us all warmed up so we can do the next slide. All right. And we pulled this from um, one of our comrades, uh, Dean Spade, um, uh, who's done some amazing work in the community. Check them out. Um, but we are going to do a little warm up called a chatterfall. So the way this is going to work is we're going to ask you a question. And we're going to have you write your answer into the chat, but don't press enter until we say so. So once again, I'm gonna ask you a question. You all are gonna have 30 seconds to write your answer into the chat. You're not gonna press send yet. And then when I ask you to, we're all going to press it at the same time and we will get a, much like a waterfall, a chatterfall of all of our answers. And I will uh, read some of them out together. And I think, that uh, this exercise is a great way to be and play with each other. So here we go. My question for you all is, what is a favorite mad and or disabled character in media that you love? So this could be TV shows, this could be movies, this could be books, anime, etc. The question is, what is one of your favorite mad and or disabled characters in media. And I'm actually gonna give you a full minute. You're gonna type it into the comments, but don't press send yet. I will give you a countdown. So here we go. Once I keep doing this. There's just so many to choose from. There's <laughs> such a wealth of disabled and mad people in media. <laughs> All right, five more seconds. And I'm gonna count down and then you can press send in three, two, one, drop those answers in the comments. Here we go. Mm -hmm. So press answer. Wow, that chatterfall, what happened all at once. Up oh, here, it keeps coming. Okay, I'm gonna read some of these out as someone who loves television. And by love, I mean have a love-hate relationship. This is, this is gonna be fantastic. Cheshire Cat, boom. Catwoman, mm. And Trapped Up from She-Ra, yes. Mm. fantastic. We've got- Scarlet Witch, yes. Ooh, I am seeing Dory from Finding Nemo, of course. Gonna wait for our ASL folks to catch up. <gasps> it's Animal from the Muppets! Y'all are magic. Oh, yes. Eeyore, because he is sad all the time, clinically depressed but he is still hella loved and accepted no matter what, and he can still enjoy a bit of life more easily. This is really beautiful and fantastic because the reality is, is living in this very ableist, insanist world, it can be very difficult for many of us to find representations of disabled and or mad um, representation. Yes, the Mad Hatter. Diane Nguyen, yes. All right, y'all. Mm, mm. We got books. All right, please feel free to check some of those out if you haven't already. Um, hopefully that got some of us a little warmed up for our participatory parts. We will have some writing 
later on, but I am going to get us into the meat of it uh, by passing it on to Lilac. Hi, friends. So um, some of you may have come and have a little bit of idea of what, idea of what a mad map is, and some of us may not know at all. And that's okay, because, you know, at one point, I didn't know either. Um, and, uh, like, the um, uh, uh, Comrade Dean Spade said, a, a mad map is a guide we can make for ourselves, um, usually uh, best worked on in moments where we're feeling more centered and having more capacity, that we can turn into moments where things go sideways. We feel ourselves slipping into more difficult states. A mad map can be like a little gift of preparation for the future self who is going in, into potentially dangerous waters. So that's a really important thing. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it's an act of self-care, right? And self-care in this world oftentimes has been uh, commodified into like doing things that cost money, like face masks and things like that, you know, extravagances and luxuries. And those things are great and they're, they're valid forms of self-care, but the ways that we really attend and attune to ourselves and our mental health can also be a great way of taking care of our, ourselves and our future selves and making sure that we're getting the care that we need when we're in crisis um, and uh, preparing a little gift. So let's move on to the next slide. So you might be asking, how do I get started? Um, and that's actually a really good question. Can mad maps uh, begin by taking an inventory of ourselves? We have to uh, we have to like uh, work towards self awareness to be able to know ourselves and know what it is that we want and and, and where we're going, where we've been, um, to understand our emotional landscapes because you know we may be. A different type of way when we are act in an activated space, you know, um, and also we want want to know what 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 world we want to live in, what are our goals for the future, um, and map maps can be really great tools for this. Um, let's see, um, we can move forward. Next slide. So, but it isn't so simple because you know, for a lot of us mad and physical folks, you know, we're taught in from beginning from a very young age, you know, how to how to act and behave. We're act we're we're taught scripts and we're taught how to mask our behaviors so that we get the acceptance that we need, the love that we need, so we can get our needs met. You know, we you know we un understood that the more we are approximated close to, to normal or to or what seen as, as desirable, you know, the more we were able to get our needs met and the further we actually got from ourselves, um, excuse the background noise, I live in a busy street. Um, but, uh, but, um, but our stories have been written for, uh, have been, our stories have been written uh, for us by ableism and the medical industrial complex, right? So we want to take our stories back. And Mad Maps actually provides us with the opportunity to reauthor our stories on our terms and remember that it, that our perspective is valid because we are the ones who are living them. And so we want to give ourselves license to 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 you know to say what we have to say about ourselves and, and tell our own stories. Next slide. Great. Let's take a look at how that happens. Enter it. Floor is yours. Fantastic. And I also saw in the chat, um, there was a question around uh, the definition of MAD, which is a fantastic one. And I forgot to bring our link to the MAD movement, um, of which uh, we in this moment are drawing from. But please, please feel free to jump in and do some research, because it is definitely a part of, like many of uh, our identities and movements around identity, it's a part of a political movement and had been a part of a political movement um, in a space of lack at a space of the mental health industrial complex. Uh, not only not serving many of us, uh, the, those of us who are uh, identify as crazy or neurodivergent or mad, but also the abuse suffered at the hands um, of the mental health industrial complex. So please, check it out or in the spirit of community participation 
if someone wants to pull up the Vice article on the MAD movement and drop that link in the chat, do it. All right. So I will move into looking at the system tree, um, which we love to use here at Fire uh, Fireweed. Um, and we love to use this analogy, or I specifically love to use this analogy because we were born on this planet and this earth, and there was so much under capitalism and imperialism um, and the effects of it that remove us from understanding ourselves as a part of an ecosystem. And I think a lot of damage is done there to our frameworks when we cannot see what we are feeding and pulling from. Um, it can expand our worldview. So we have our system tree. It's a way of understanding and looking at a lot of the systems that are being enacted upon us. Um, we as humans, we don't grow food, right? But food knows how to grow. So we have the ways in which us humans have figured out how to get nourishment from the soil um, in the form of the plants and the, and the animals that we consume is by the one of the best ways is to nourish the soil itself. Okay, so let's so when we're looking at systems around the mental health industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, etc. Uh, we like to look first at what is the soil, what is nourishing the systems that have grown up that are impacting us and our communities for better or for worse. Okay, a moment for you to catch up. All right, so let's look at the mental health system tree together. And that will be our next slide. And fantastic. Fantastic, thank you. I'm checking into the comments, great. So the mental health system tree, and we're going to ask everyone to participate in this, much like um, we did with the Chatterfall, but you don't have to wait. We're going to be looking at all the aspects of uh, the mental health system tree as this room knows it, as it is in this moment. Um, and we're going to be creating a collective definition and understanding of it together for this activity. So first we're gonna think about the roots, right? What is the soil made of? What are, what are the attitudes and the beliefs and the values and principles that are the foundation of our mental health system as we know it today? Okay, then we're gonna look at the branches and collectively think about what are the mechanisms of delivery that are born of these foundational beliefs and attitudes? What systems pull from this poil, from the soil um, to make them come true? What are some of the techniques? What are the actions um, that complete these attitudes, that enforce these attitudes um, upon us? And then we wanna look at the leaves. So what are the outcomes of this system? So let's start first and foremost at the roots. So let's check it right now because we are already jumping in. I see in the comments, so next slide. And we're gonna look at the roots slide. All right, perfect. So roots in the comments, I would love for folks to chime in. Um, what are the, what is the soil of the mental health system made of? Uh, what are these foundational beliefs, attitudes, principles, right? And I'm gonna just read some out for examples. Feelings are dangerous. Um, uh, you know, in a capitalist society, right? Crazy people are non-productive. Um, Mad people, crazy people as dangerous. Um, we have um, eugenics as, um, as a belief, disposability culture and fear. Um, 
belief that there are a limited number of, of ways of being healthy or normal or acceptable. And if you deviate from these norms, you lose your rights of autonomy and self-determination. What do we have? Individualism. Straight up, here we are. I am in the United States. Emotions is dangerous. Chemical ashes. Uh, whiteness as the model itself. Ah, people with disabilities needing to be separated and hidden away. There is an entire section of our history here, and you all should check that out as well in other workshops about um, those particular laws and when that began and the inception of um, asylums as sites of control, hiding, and um, experimentation. White supremacy and capitalism suffering in silence. Inner conversation as uh, signs of loss of reason, Yes, yes, no intersectionality, you need to be useful. Y'all have it. Feel free to keep on dropping them. These are important and to keep on looking at the comments as you can or reading them. Binaries, punishment. Um, but let's move now into the branches, right? What are the mechanisms by which um, these attitudes are carried out? into our world, right? What are the ways in which um, colonialism is enacted? Um, what are some of the techniques and the systems and technologies that enforce, uh, you know, for example, uh, crazy people are dangerous. Who do we call when someone is in crisis? You know, so we have the criminalization of crisis, right? Laws. Um, we have language, mandated reporting, uh, policing of uh, mad folks, separation. Um, yes, keep going. I see a question of what are the positives we can keep, though, and we can keep them. But it is very, very worthy, I'm seeing, to see all of the aspects that are really just where we are at right now. Stoicism is healthy biasness, the prison industrial complex, taboo, inferiority, the health insurance industry. I'm not sure if there's anyone here from outside of the states where you all have health care, but um, I'm really glad that you all do. Um, yes, healing, violence, assimilation. All right, forced sterilization and a history of such. All right. Let's move into, because these are important, but let's keep going into the leaves. What are some of the outcomes um, for some of these? What are some of the outcomes um, from the foundational beliefs, right? Into the mechanisms of delivery and how does that land with us? So I see a lack of ability to receive justice, especially at work, like with unions and stuff. Um, fragmented communities and distrust, you know, when the, all of these things are happening and we're in different positions of receiving care or violence. Grading individuals and the idea of success, lying to appear sane, the stigma, right? Incarceration, family separation, poverty, Insurance not covering mental health care in Canada, dang. All right, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to start it off here just because I think it's really important to think about where we are at and to be able to have a good brain around, or not a good brain, but just for us to start thinking creatively about where we're at, what we see, what we are noticing in our communities, and where we want to be. Where do we want to nourish our communities and ourselves if this has been the uh, environment that we have all been growing in, right? Segregation, separation, non-beliefs, um, isolation. I see suicide. I also see the stigmatization of um, suicidality. Um, and the criminalization of such. Ooh, and for those who are following Brittany, um, and that was their first experience with uh, conservator conservatorship, we have that as well, yeah. So let's move into the next slide. All right. And I think 
yeah, keep feeling free to drop it in the chat. But I think that it's really important for us to look at these things. But for me specifically, uh, when thinking about the tree and thinking about looking at the systems that are around us and that impact myself and my communities and that we were born from, it's important to think of it as a tree because without me really looking at the soil, the soil, the beliefs that I have come up in, how can I create or help with my comrades and my community create options that serve us better when we are experiencing the oppression and violences of the state uh, when we have not remedied the soil. Uh, for those of you who have heard uh, that before or who work with soil, there is the idea of like, what does it look like to heal and remedy the soil that we are growing these things from so that we can create healthier trees, trees that serve us, All right? Yes, yes, wellness checks, yeah. You can just keep on checking in the chat. So um, I offered you all to be able to use these models, to look at the tree, to look at the mental health system as it is now, and to look at the ways in which they are in us. Like these are the things that we've grown out of. So what does it look like to really do some work of pouring soil through the soil so that we are not replicating um, the systems that um, are harming our peoples? We can, uh, and then I can pass it over to Lila. Yes, mend the soil. Hi, hey, everyone. <clears throat> go ahead. Yeah, good work. <laughs> so um, as we know, um, like the mental health system is not the only system that authors our stories but there's lots of people who are actually trying to take our agency from us, take our narratives from us and <clears throat> use them to kind of tell a story that is convenient for them. Um, we're gonna talk about how we can use Mad Maps and uh, uh, to explore how we can reclaim our stories. Um, next slide, please. So let's, we're gonna take a look at a, a character whose name is Mary and um, and, and in his story, we're gonna see like um, uh, a characteristic of, of, of systems uh, that they, that these, that these, um, the way that her narrative is told is really indicative of, 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 a, of a thinning of her story. And when I think of a thinning of her story, I think of it as if you're making a soup, right? You're making a soup and you have all these ingredients, all these rich things going in in your story, but people keep watering it down, adding water to it. And then it's like, it just like dilutes like the power of it, the nutrients, it takes away from who we are. But when we actually like let that come to a simmer and let that water evaporate and take out th what they've added, then you get the real story of who you are and you really get to the thickness and the hardiness of who you are as a person. And you really get to reauthor your story. And this is kind of what I like to do in this exercise. Next slide, please. So we're gonna to read to you um, Mary's story and it's in a couple of slides um, and I'll read it to you slowly. Um, it says, Mary's family has lived in chronic poverty since the sources of employment in her rural town were closed down and most people in the town lost their main source of income. Therefore, Mary has been poor all of her life. Despite the lack of wealth, Mary's family is very loving and supporting. They make a point to get together at least twice a week and they share a meal, watch a movie, have conversations, or play board games. Mary's town was deeply impacted by environmental trauma. For most of her life, Mary drank poison water that has given her a chronic illness. Next slide. Because of the lack of resources, Mary is not able to get the medical help she needs. She missed school so much that she dropped out of high school. This made Mary very lonely and depressed. Mary was embarrassed and started progressively isolating from her peers until she hardly had any friends left. Mary spends her days with her nieces, whom she enjoys very much, her next door neighbor and her pet or her pets. Because of the unpredictable nature of her condition, she is not able to remain employed. Mary has been unemployed for the last decade, and she's very angry about her lack of ability to hold 
down a job because of medical reasons and often lashed out at employers and coworkers. Mary eventually stopped leaving her house except for a few social outings every week. Mary has been receiving social benefits that allowed her to meet basic food and, ho and housing needs. Okay, that's, uh, that's the beginning of, of Mary's story. And we have it told from a lot of different directions. I'm sure, I'm sure there's probably like lots of nuances even left out here, right? But like, uh, but this is like the, the fullest story that we have available to us, right? And, um, but this story can be, people can cherry pick from it to take out what they want. Um, for example, next slide, please. Let's imagine that Mary lives in this town with this like toxic water, right? And uh, the town mayor wants to make budget cuts to social services because he thinks that people like Mary are lazy and they're abusing the system, right? So how would he cherry pick Mary's story if he were to use Mary as a case study, say? How would he, how, how would he cherry pick this story to get, you know, to get, uh, to push his agenda? So let's see the next slide. Antoinette's going to help me read the parts that maybe the juiciest parts that he might choose for his, uh, for his survey. Mary has been poor all of her life. Next slide. She dropped out of high school, has been unemployed for the last decade, lashed out at employers and coworkers. Mary has been receiving social benefits that allow her to meet basic food and housing needs. So as we see, like in this situation, the mayor can really paint a picture that, that, that kind of like pushes forth his agenda of making Mary look like somebody who is, uh, you know, Somebody who is, you know, what is the word? Um, a uh, dependent on the state. Somebody who is, who is like sucking up resources, and uh, and uh, that's that is really unfortunate. But that's that's uh, that's sometimes how like uh, sometimes people in government look at us. But also people in the in the medical industry also have their own perspective. And why don't you talk about that? All right, and we can go to the next slide here for that. So the medical model, how does the medical model or how might the medical model um, read Mary's story? What parts would they pull out as juicy? So um, I can read that, um, I can actually pull it out again if you can go to the next slide. So for the medical model, what they might feel is important, um, maybe if we're looking at health insurance. Mary has been poor all of her life. Chronic illness. Dropped out of high school. This made Mary very lonely and depressed, embarrassed, isolating from her peers until she hardly had any friends left, unemployed, angry, lashed out at employers and coworkers, stopped leaving her house. So in this particular story, it's a, like a deep pathologization of all of, uh, of many of Mary's, many of the aspects of her life that feel relevant, I guess, if like we were coming from a health insurance perspective. Um, and it kind of feels like these things are framed in such a way as Mary seems like much of a liability, almost. Um, the rest of her story does not exist. Um, let's move down to the next one. Next slide. So like, what if Mary has like a rich relative that doesn't really want to help because let's see how they see it. They might see, they might have something that colors their perspective. Uh, next slide. Here it says, uh, Mary's family is very loving and supporting. They make a point to get together at least twice a week and they share a meal and watch a movie and have conversations and play board games. Next slide. 
Mary spends her days with her nieces, whom she enjoys very much. Her next door neighbor are her pets. Social outings every week. Mary has been receiving social benefits that allow her to meet her basic food and housing needs. So I think that it's really lovely that this relative sees the wealth of love that Mary does have. And yeah, some of us do have like, you know, like a wealth of, you know, love in our life. But, you know, when it comes down to it, Mary doesn't have her needs met, her core needs met. And, and she's not being seen as a whole person who uh, should have access to her whole life and her and uh, to make decisions for herself and things like that. And, 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 um, uh, this person could be helping her and instead chooses to only see, you know, the sunniest parts of Mary's life, which are, you know, the only sunny parts of her life, it seems. Go ahead, Antoinette. Oh, next slide, please. Yes. So, um, the characteristics of a system is that they promote a thinning of our stories, right? And the, when they do that, they actually strip away all of these parts of who we are. And they, and they, they, this is an act of erasure, you know, they, they take what's, what's, and if you think, if you look at the stories that we've been handed to us by history, you know, they've been told by the people who, who wanted to tell the stories, you know, were the Catholic missionaries telling stories about, you know, Native Americans and erasing all of their customs? Or was it, you know, people in the military who are like, you know, fighting against people in other places and 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 and, and had their agenda at heart? And and in this situation, we remember that whenever somebody tells our story for us, they they are actually taking away vital elements of who we are. And we deserve to be seen as whole people with with rich stories and rich identities uh, and that are nuanced and, and we deserve to be, you know, seen and observed and held, you know, for all of that we are. And that's, what, that's why we think that Mad Maps can be so uh, important. But for now, next slide. We're actually, we are a disability justice and healing justice collective. And so we like to uh, implore you to take a, a quick break with us and take care of your body minds as you see fit. Go have a stretch, you know, if you need to go have some water, um, you know, have a snack, you know, whatever you gotta do, relax. And we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you so much. And we'll catch you back. And just for folks to know, our next activity will be a writing activity. So um, get prepared as well as you break. All right.
Hey folks, we're back. Thank you so much. Have a quick stretch. Hope you got some water. Um, all right, and we are back. Um, can we get the next slide, please? So Mad Maps. Um, like we were talking about before, there are so many different kinds of ways that the world tries to water down our story. And... Um, dilute our stories, right? Mad Maps is about reclaiming our stories and reauthoring them ourselves. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to be doing some writing and reflecting ex exercises. Um, and, and, uh, the, and it's uh, uh, the purpose of these reflections is going to be kind of just to, um, to get you to understand the stories that you were given, um, how, uh, like the labels that were given to you, who gave them to you, um, and like the, the, the story of your origin. And um, so uh, we're going to, you know, find out if, if uh, you know, like, it, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to have three writing prompts and we're going to give you 10 minutes. And in these 10 minutes, you're going to take time to uh, write down um, uh, about these uh, three different categories, labels, who, and origin story. As I was saying, labels is, um, this is a prompt. Within your comfort zone, make a list of labels that were given to you. So labels that were given to me as, you know, a young person growing up was like a stay-at-home daughter, you know, was something really hurtful as a, as a disabled person, you know, or like, you know, like, you know, a burden or a liability or, or it may have been, you know, you know, like something else for you, you know? So what were the labels given to you? And you can even talk about how they impacted you. Um, uh, the next one is who, um, who gave you each label? Was it professionals? Was it teachers, coworkers? Friends, family. So I remember the first time that somebody called me fat in public. And I remember it was a teacher. I remember the context of when I was said, right? So digging up that and remembering that, you know, it was an important part of this writing reflection for me when I did something like this. The next thing is origin story, which I love a good comic book. Uh, origin story. How did each of these labels originate? What is their, what is their story? So like, what, what is the context of it? Like, why why did somebody say like say that to you? Why did somebody put that label upon you? Is it because you know were, were you the the eldest daughter, and because of that you were you know bestowed all these responsibilities that you didn't want? You know, whatever it is, you know, talk about it. We're gonna give you ten minutes uh, to reflect, and we had music, but uh, technical difficulties is not really allowing us to to um, to, to do that today. So we're gonna just um, have a little bit of radio silence as we reflect. Um, and um, I'll be back uh, in 10 minutes. And just that, um, maybe we can give you a five minute uh, sound when um, we've hit the five minute mark and then we'll let you know again at 10, but we'll just um, unmute. Um, and then um, we can let you all know that it's halfway through our writing time, but please feel free if you um, need music to play some in the background. Um, yeah, thank you all. All right. Yeah, and please write however is most accessible to you. If that's a computer, if that's a, your phone, if that's, if that's your uh, a pad of paper, you know, and write as much and as little as you want. It could be just jotting down a few bullet points or it could be your prolific novel, whatever it is, whatever feels comfortable for you. All right, let's go.
And this is Antoinette letting you all know that is five minutes and our halfway point for the writing exercise. We will have five more minutes and also want to encourage folks to write and share from our comfort zones, knowing we have only so much built trust in the room, but that you will get to take these prompts away with you in the future. I will give you another heads up at five minutes. All right.
All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you all, all of you who were able to participate in that. So we wanted to offer a little time to think about this exercise and discuss. Um, and we can uh, go to the next slide as we work on um, our report back from our writing exercises as we think about map mapping. And we can go to our next slide. Mm. So we would love for folks to reflect on these questions as we uh, move into this particular discussion or brainstorm, which is our first question, did the labels tell your story as you would write it? And I did see some comments, and just so you all know, I am not able to track as many of the comments as there are, which does not mean they are not valuable. I just am not able to keep up with all of them, but folks should still participate. But yes, we're wondering, are there reflections? Um, once again, keeping in mind the uh, established trust that has been built um, here, uh, so staying in our comfort zones, um, did the initial aspect of the exercise, um, the labels, did they tell the story as you would write it about yourself? Um, and if folks had any, any reflections they want to drop into the comments, and I will read them aloud. Yeah, it's been quite lately in the comments, it seems people have been Oh. Chatting it up. <clears throat> oh, oh, okay. Here we go. Um, so I'm seeing I'm seeing comments around. Yes, haven't given myself these labels exactly, but have definitely internalized them. Feelings around the labels uh, personally, um, a victim and survivor for some folks, uh, for someone. Yes. Never, the, someone was uh, mentioning, I think Dion talking about never giving my, giving yourself any of the labels, but definitely internalizing them um, and really resonating, going back to thinking about the tree and the systems and the soils that we're a part of, um, like what does feed us, whether or not we claim them or have them. Oh, we have some solutions like, yes, um, food stamps for all and universal basic income. I am with you, comrade. Um, from Tim, some of them did, some of them didn't, and some I would maybe use, but definitely differently than they've been defined for me by others and systems. Yes. I'm going to let people continue to type in. And the question is, did the labels tell your story as you would write it? I see some were hurtful, words and words matter. I see yeah, they were part of my life story. Can't deny that some of those experiences of diagnoses have had an effect on how my life has gone. Getting psychiatric diagnosis as a young adult, subsequent rejection as a story of self-empowerment and breaking free. We have from Iman, the labels only told a part of my story. We also have labels that try to obliterate my story and fighting back, trying to reclaim the weird and strange, sometimes repeating narratives on bad days and sometimes able to tell myself stories with more agency. Ah, so someone was told that they were a professional troublemaker and now they are a prof 
know that they were a troublemaker and now they are a professional troublemaker. Good for you. At least you're getting paid for it. That's good. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. And universal income for all. All right. So want to look at, yes. So if these labels, for those who found some of these labels not fitting into um, any or all of the narratives about ourself, um, what words would you have used? And if they related to a story, you as a story, what would the story look like in your own words? I see the labels were also ways for others to figure out where I stood without knowing where I thought I stood. That was me slapping my chest. Poof. Hearing, I don't always have conceptual resources yet to tell my story differently. That's why I love collective sharing. Yes. Hearing from Jasmine, the labels were negative. Learning to let go of them has been hard because there's been realness behind them and the labels I give myself were the worst. We have folks thinking about the good daughter role and label a lot as a first generation immigrant from the global south definitely having the good child good daughter uh resonating with that comment <laughs> creative we have survival of as a survivor of generational and directly experienced trauma so in your own words, your story. Also have from Molly, labels, even words often feel too static and are often comparative. Indeed. And I'm gonna read this last one out, but please continue to drop them in the chat. I find some labels useful as shorthand for talking with other trauma peers. I can say I have an ACE score of eight and other folk get the idea without my re-traumatizing myself with the full story. Fantastic. Which leads us into um, our next point. Uh, let's see if we have enough writing time. I think we can do a short, uh, a short write after this as we continue to move and guide us. A five minute write? Yeah, maybe a five minute, right? Okay. I like that. So let's go into the next slide. Um, and we're going to change this to uh, five minutes instead. Um, but all of these questions are questions that we would offer are fantastic ways for us to explore um, and ground ourselves in our story. And as um, I, one of you all mentioned, even like looking at the ways in which, or not even, because I resonate very much with that, the ways in which our stories move, change, when we put attention on them, as we move through life, as different systems interact with us. Um, so for this next writing and reflection exercise, as it is so important for us to look at our stories, um, we have, three little prompts and your answers won't have be complete. They don't have to. Um, it's just a good place to start. Um, we have, so what are important things, catching up with the comments, what are some important things in my life and what matters the most right now? We think that it's important for us to also in all of this, put attention on what it is we are here for, what it is we want to do, what brings us joy, what fulfills our purpose, where our goals are. So what are important things in our life and what matters most? We've been talking a lot about the systems and impacts of multiple systems upon us, but what of us? 
what of what we are doing and trying to do even inside and around these systems that work or do not work for us. And then we also have who, right? Who are the people who make you feel safest in times of crises? Okay. So when we are thinking about where we are going, but also what we are doing and what we are coming across, um, when we are moving through our intergenerational trauma work, when we are being confronted by aspects of oppression that bring us to crises, who are the people who will make us feel safest in times of crises? And then looking a little bit in our origin story aspect, who am I when I'm feeling well? And how do I feel when I am feeling well? So once again, Five minute right, what are the most important things in my life? What matters most? Who are the people that make me feel safest in times of crises? And who am I when I am feeling well? How do I feel when I'm feeling well? Because we are here to think about making plans and maps for the here and now, for the future, for the crises, for the calm. All right? So five minutes, once again, with our own silence, but you all can play music in the background. Right, and then we will come back. Yes.
Okay, welcome back. And before we move on to our debrief from that, um, just wanted to see if I can pull a few more comments from our prior debrief. Uh, let's see, we had people again talking about labels and the stories that we came into, that we were born into, by the systems that were enacted upon us, by our histories, by our families. Um, we have, um, I long for a label, the days it meant access to care or one label when doctors fought over what to call me before I imagined a world where access wasn't built on labels. Also have undiagnosable. For whatever reason, neurodivergent people exist. We have plenty to offer, but we don't fit the mold that we currently live within for capitalist extraction of our labor to beat the system. And also just one more, the labels felt constraining before, and now I see them as something that helps my immigrant family assimilate and fit in. I think it's important for us to point that labels and some of these stories, they can help, they can assist, they can shape, they can hold, but we experience them and we get to interrogate them as we tell our stories and as we create our maps for how we need to move in this world. So, or yeah, let's just pick out a few, a few reflections from the exercise. Um, looking at uh, what are important things in our lives, what matters most. Um, I see here, someone said goal, to make the most of what can be done whilst I have this corporeal form. Any other reflections from that exercise? Who are the people that uh, that make us feel the safest in times of crises? Uh, who are you when you are feeling well? And how do you feel when you are feeling well? I'll wait for folks to type in. And I want to Yes, yeah, slide to the next slide as we wait for folks to type in. A reflection. Sometimes the people who make me feel safest aren't the people that I organize with. Mm -hmm. What matters most is my recovery and being able to support others, to empower themselves in whatever way they need feeling very lost and having trouble knowing. Ooh, who am I when I am feeling well, creative, loving, passionate? A goal to stay connected to the universe. And we wanna offer that all of these questions and these, these uh, writing exercises, this could be the beginning of your mad map of you writing out and us practicing writing out our stories uh, the stories that we came into the ones that we are impacted by the systems that were enacted upon us and what we want what we want in terms of where we feel we are going our goals for example to stay connected to the universe to how we feel when we are at our wellest creative, exciting, excited, um, what we need in the people around us when we are in crisis or a struggle or transition. Um, also thinking about where those people are around us, who fulfills different functions, right? Let's see. We have some other folks talking about, yes, I feel fed by and crave connection when I feel well and get isolated when I am not well. Okay. We have Feeling open-hearted, access to choice, intentional, aligned in my values, embodied, and moving with integrity. 
and I'll see you back here. Uh, oh, there's many. I'm, I'm very behind. Um, we have someone saying that their faith is what they lean on in crisis. And when they're feeling well, feeling like a superwoman and fabulous, right? Friends and family able to see and love all of me. Mm, 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 mm. And we have the last one. Oh, wait, more comments. We have, I don't feel safe with other people when I'm really in struggle town, but trees, river, mountains always feel safe. We get to author and write out what works and makes sense for us and have these out here so that we can draw for them, draw from them as we move through. Is it a person? Are there practices that make us feel safe, right? So I'm gonna go to the next slide. You all can continue to write in, um, but we wanted to offer that as we wrap, as we come to the close of this, um, you are going to receive all of the slides um, in a Mad Maps hangout, handout um, with guided questions um, after this workshop. We just wanted to start us on the process of it together in this particular space. What we found has been helpful for us in creating them. Um, and I already saw people answering some aspects of um, some, some of these prompts already in, in the comments, in the ways in which they are answering. Like um, one that often comes up for me is when do labels help me and when do they hurt me? And these are new labels, old labels, labels being stories that I come into, labels being diagnoses or that which is enacted upon me so that I can access um, resources, right? When do they help me? When do they hurt me? Um, making a list of your emotional landscapes and one that is a particular um, use for me and is someone who is healing from intergenerational trauma, what is the name and the story of my anger, right? So we will have that all for you to continue to work on, to bring back to your communities. Um, but with time where it heals right now, I think, so that we have time for a little Q&A. Oh, let's answer some questions before. Move on. An emotional landscape. And I would love other folks to answer that as well. For me, my emotional landscape is all of the spaces and places that my emotions manifest and uh, come up in my life, right? So am I someone who my rage takes on a screaming form or is it very silent, you know? Is it, do I experience my creativity on the page and my excitement verbally? Do I feel it physically? Do other people, are they able to read when I am in my deepest despair? Do I find uh, crying to be at my access or am I unable to cry? And there are other places that I um, experience grief, right? That would be my way of understanding my emotional landscape. Okay. But first, next slide. We have things to do, so I'm going to pass it on to Lilac. So this happens before we all leave today. Great, great, great. Can I have the next slide? <clears throat> Well, so we've had such an amazing time with y'all today, um, and we have really cherished the opportunity to share our knowledge with you. Um, but uh, we like to keep growing and uh, and improving as facilitators, as people, uh, and improving our offerings to community. Uh, and this is like a show of our commitment to y'all and to the community that we are building together. So if you can please do us a favor, we're going to drop it into the link, uh, into the chat. 
And uh, please fill out a really quick, comprehensive feedback form we've made for you. It's uh, uh, our comrade Agustina put it together and Maya put it together. And it is just really easy just to get some of the, you know, taste of what you appreciated, what you think can be improved on, what you think could be added. You know, so many things were shared, so many rich resources, and we'd like to hold on to those. So thank you so much um, for, for that. Um, we're going to have that in the chat. Uh, all right. Um, and the next slide, please. No music. All right. It's time oh. for a little cue. Go ahead. Are we going to give them some time to do the feedback form before we moved on? I think we do have time. Yeah. If, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the other slide. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I jumped again a little bit. We're going to play music, but, you know, pesky copyright laws. Maybe like three minutes. Yeah, three yeah. minutes. Thank you. Yeah, and like like uh, we said before, um, there will be a handout that will be available to you that will be able to uh, give you some more of the uh, of these prompts and concepts that uh, will make it accessible uh, for you to start uh, your journey with MedMap. So don't worry about that. We got your back, and uh, we've posted there in the chat the feedback form. Thank you very much. Even if you can't get to it all right now, just have leave that window open and do what you can now and come back to it later. But if you can send it off right now, that'd be lovely because we know we have, you know, secure the bag and get that, those come get, you know, get those comments in. Um, so we really appreciate that.
great, great. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. All right, fabulous. We are now at the Q&A question and answer portion of our program. This is a chance for you to type in the chat any questions you might be having, uh, itching to, be ha to ask. Um, we know we've given you a lot of content today and that there's a lot of new concepts for some of us and uh, we'd like to explore some of them with you. So why don't you just jot them down in the chat and I'll read them out loud and we'll do our best to, um, to answer them. And this is Antoinette. Um, earlier, we had someone ask, what is an emotional landscape? And I offered my definition. Um, but we had um, one of our comrades at Fireweed answer as well, um, which is, if you think of yourself as a territory you are mapping, where is your respite? Where is your storm? Those are the landscapes. Perfect. All right. Thank you for highlighting that. Awesome. So let's see. Um, give us a moment and let the questions populate. Okay, we have um, how do we keep man mapping from becoming another duty um, of the responsibleized neoliberal self, a duty to stay tuned up and productive? And that's a really good question because there's a lot of stuff that could just become part of the everyday rigmarole of, you know, you know, just like this very uh easy prescriptivist idea of you ought to do this to get this result. But I think that mad mapping could be an opportunity for us to really check in with ourselves. It could be a chance for us to be most authentic with ourselves. And that is uh that is like like how you escape from being a real duty to it's it's not about accomplishing a list of tasks and checking things off. It's about really just a, making time and space to attune to yourself and seeing what it is that you actually want and need. Um, and that um, that can't be done in a systemized, you know, easy, uh, like I guess, responsibleized, neoliberal way. You have to really take time and, and hold those questions. And I think that that's what mad mapping offers you. It offers you an opportunity to like slow down and just ask some of those questions and really figure out where you're at. And I saw earlier there was a question around the um, blue slide with the small pink uh, lettering that had some prompts, some Mad Maps prompt sample. So one of the things that we'll have for you all at the end of this is one, making our slides available, but also kind of a Mads Map guide for each of us to work on. And these are some of the questions that we were offering that are great places for people to start with this uh, uh, writing out um, our stories, looking at our landscapes um, where we, what we need and what we want. So some of those questions, yeah, we're gonna go back to that where, for example, what are key aspects of my identity? Um, taking time to really ponder and think about how do I know that someone sees me? And I think that that question can be really helpful for me when I specifically are in times of crises and when I am in times of self-doubt or suspicion and I'm trying to find um, grounding with the people around me, the more that I can take time to look at, 
document and write more about myself and the map and landscape of my brain and movements, the more of a guide I have when it is not so easily at my access, when my facilities are not as um, easily accessed or resourced because of crises, because of the state, whatever it is. Um, you know, when do labels help me? When do they har har harm me? Um, I think all of these questions and then the guide that we will give you can give folks more agency when moving through not just our well time, but when we need help um, and figuring out how to get them when it's help from ourselves, but when it's also help of us being connected to communities of care, right? That's my answer to that. But also please feel free to answer in the chat as well. Yeah, I really like the question that uh, was Ruth asking, what strategies do you suggest to help uh, people not fall into the negativity trap in the soil so we can keep what's good in the soil as well as what's not, as, as well as what's bad in the soil? Uh, I think you're asking how can we like weed out the the bad the good elements from the bad elements in, in our soil? And I, and I think like when I think about that, I think of my brother is actually a, a chemical engineer and he actually did a lot of work in, in, in soil remediation. And some of the sites that they do uh, work on, like it could take them like a hundred years to get all the uranium out, you know? And it it's it's important to remember that sometimes these things took time to become ingrained in us and it'll take time for us to, to work on them, right? And so the the, that like enriching our soil and making our soil healthy is gonna take uh is gonna take a little bit of, of time for for you to really dig into what it is that is um is really like at the base at your base. What are your core beliefs and values? How do you change those? Is, and a lot of times you do that like uh by the like the way you the way that we, we we talk to ourselves, the way we talk about ourselves, you know, those kinds of things change. You know, our core values. If we if we align them with how how we uh, how we I guess like are in our most private moments in our mind. You know, that's how we are able to maybe weed out some of those bad elements and look for some of those good elements because they're there. So a good question was asked about, could you give an example of MadMass being used in a time of crisis uh, and shared with others in the to prepare for times of crisis? And one thing that I really like to do is doing the exercise about who do I feel safe with? Because that allows me to like realize that the, even that in the moment where I don't feel safe, where I feel like everyone is not to be trusted, I know that in my state where I love myself and care for myself at my best, that I have identified people who can also love and care for me. And I can trust that part of myself to have good judgment, you know? And in that moment where I, I know that I am, you know, being activated by whatever kinds of things that are coming up, that I can trust that, you know, these people are going to have my back. And that's how I can you actually use them. I can actually like, look them up and, and look up numbers and look up the things that feel safe to talk about with them and the things that I can talk about with them. Maybe somebody who I have, you know, who was also, a, you know, a, a survivor, you know, I can, I can talk to them about my survivor stories when I'm feeling, you know, triggered about something, you know, or maybe it's somebody who, you know, like, uh, who, um, uh, for example, makes me feel like I could be my fullest, most authentic self and will help me get my mind off of, you know, all the bad things that are miring me down. That person can bring up, can help me access my best self, you know, and so those are important uh, strategies that you can actually use um, when you're actually in crisis. And it's really great to do that when you're in a place where you're the, uh, as grounded as you can be. But also they're really helpful uh, to do some of these exercises when you're in crisis yourself, right? Because actually I find it to be really 
grounding when I sit down and write my story down and dissect the elements and get everything uh, in a way where I can understand it, it allows me to feel more grounded. So for me, that's how Mad Maps has been a practical tool. And I just wanted to offer, I'm unable to track the chat as quickly as I want. There had been a question around looking at the difference between advanced directives and um, a mad map and wanted to highlight um, again, some fireweed comrade um, in offering that, yeah, the advanced directive is like a, a legal wishes document so it is, uh, it's medical, it's focused on medical wishes at times of crises. And mad maps are something that is more encompassing and is community based, right? So it is about us and it is about the widest community that we are a part of looking at how we interact with all of the people around us to get our needs met or what other folks might need as well, right? So just wanted to highlight that for a moment. Somebody asked a question about how we used to just talk about this with young folks. Um, I have a lot of young folks in my life, uh, like uh, especially in queer families, you have like, uh, you know, older folks and younger folks. Uh, it's very intergenerational space. And I think that the best way that I can offer them, the best thing that I can offer them is to show them an example of me doing it and me living it uh, and me actually being vocal about my process and not trying to like put on airs that I got my, my stuff together on every given day, you know? Um, that I think modeling that, uh, that vulnerability and that like lived experience really will be the best thing to encourage youth um, to show them that they can make it too because that's why you that's why uh, we need each other in, in 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 intergenerational spaces we need to show each other how to survive as marginalized people how to get through by example you know and uh, you can't you can't be what you can't see so we show them what they can be we show them there's ways to make it through. Looks like we have time, maybe Lilac, for us to look at one more question and then we sure. should. Oh, actually, we should do our little closing. We have three yeah. minutes. Yeah, all righty. Oh. I'm so sad that we're at the end, but last slide. Dum, dum, dum. All right, thank you so much, folks, for, for having us and thank you for being with us. We know you can be spending your day any which way and we appreciate you bringing your wonderful selves and all you have to offer here. We're going to send you off with this nice little activity. We're going to do a chatter fall like we did before. Now, reminder, we're going to type it in the, to, the, to the chat box, but you're going to wait one minute until we can hit send. And then we're going to see the cascade of comments come down like a waterfall and read them out. And the question, the prompt question is, what is something you want to start practicing or practice more? It could be something that you already established. It could be, you know, time for meditation. It could be, it could be uh, more journaling. It could be, you know, what is it? What you want to practice? So we'll start writing it and we'll, we're going to give you a minute and then we're going to hit that send button and see what everyone has to say. Ready? Get to scribbling. Go. All right, y'all, let them go. On your marks, get set, hit it. 
okay, deep breathing more. I love that. That's really important. More compassion toward myself in times of crisis. Oh yeah, if you can offer yourself, you know, kindness and compassion, you can definitely offer it uh, to yourself in, in times of crisis. It's the best thing. Yeah, love myself more and to love others better without labels. I love that living without labels. Um, more embodied practice and allowing myself to make um, mistakes. Yeah, you know, learn without those mistakes. It's important. This is, I want to start practicing identifying what it is I want and need and how to get my me needs met, how to express my feelings. Yeah, mad maps will definitely help you with that, being able to access what it is that you want, like really assessing your needs, which would be really nice. You have walking and meditating, being more vulnerable. Yes. I always say um, when it's safe to let to let my truth out, I make room to let you in. So I love that. Saying thank you to my support systems. That's really important. Well, I like an internet. I just, I wanted to say thank you so much. This has been such a great workshop. Um, and I want to thank you both for leading the workshop, for being part of the conference. Um, we really appreciate everything that you've brought. And um, we want to let folks know that this uh, recording will stay available online on the um, same YouTube link where you found it. Um, so you can always return to these things and spend more time with the prompts and um, share with your friends. So I just wanted to say thanks again to our interpreters tonight, um, Crystal and Stephanie. And um, thank you, Antoinette and Lilac, for um, bringing all your wisdom tonight. Thanks so much and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.